Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, we'll visit the sunny south and see the large railroad empire at Florida's Cypress Gardens. We'll visit a theme park in the Pacific Northwest and its own live steam railroad. And we'll look in on one of the oldest railroad clubs in the U.S. But first, one man is largely responsible for the popularity of toy trains in the 20th century. That man was Joshua Lionel Cowan, a man who started with an idea for a simple flashlight and what he ended up with has delighted train lovers of all ages for over a century. Joshua Lionel Cohen, born in 1877, grew up in Manhattan, the eighth of nine children. An intelligent, curious, and extroverted boy, he often took apart his sister's dolls in order to see how they worked. As an adult, Cohen took a job at the Acme Electric Lamp Company. At this small electrical shop, he would develop the skills that would eventually enable him to launch his own business. On September 5, 1900, Cohen and a colleague from Acme, Harry C. Grant, filed to conduct business in New York. The firm would engage in the manufacturing of electrical novelties and would be known as the Lionel Manufacturing Company. He came up with the idea of taking his small motor and using it to power um, a crude looking railroad car on a small loop of track. And he took that, that motor and he attached it to the underside of what was really a little box on wheels, devised a, a loop of track that was two and seven eighths inches between the rails. This was not a gauge that was being used elsewhere in the United States or in Europe. Cohen sold his first railroad car not as a toy, but to a shopkeeper to attract attention to his store windows. It sold for $4, nearly half a week's wages for most people in 1900. Pretty soon the shopkeeper came back for another. Turned out he didn't use it in his window, he had sold it as a toy for the general public. Lionel now had its own product was determined to establish its own niche in a rapidly expanding toy train industry. By the end of 1902, sales had reached $22,000. By the end of the 1900s, they had nearly tripled. Cohen wanted to surpass Ives Manufacturing, which was the leading producer of toy trains in the United States. To do that, he had to come up with a more extensive line of trains. He began doing this in 1906 when he introduced a line of stamped metal trains that was built to a gauge of two and one-eighths inches between the rails. No one else in the world was doing this, not in the United States, not in Europe, and yet he called it standard gauge, a very bold assertion, yet very quickly this did become the standard among electric train producers. A marketing genius, Cohen came up with a line of accessories and sold each for $1.50. At $6 per set, plus $1.20 for batteries, this toy represented a huge piece of the household budget in 1902. Cohen quickly learned two very valuable lessons from his domestic and foreign competitors. The first was to establish a complete line of trains. He learned this from Marklin and other German competitors. And that line would include trains, rolling stock, and accessories. And this would give children the opportunity over time to acquire more and build their own little empire, their own little network of trains at home. The other thing he learned, which was important, was from Ives Manufacturing, and that is the, the importance of having an annual catalog, a wish book, in which children could look and see what was available and dream all year of what they would ask for their birthday or for the holidays. And doing this, they would see what they wanted for their empire and then have the, the uh, toys there that they could indeed get. And the idea was that this could hook them into the hobby for three, four years of their lives. From 1910 to 1920, Lionel sales grew 15 times. At the time, Lionel employed 700 workers. Sales kept increasing, and the company was a year-round success, not just a Christmas-only toy for boys. In 1931, Lionel had its first losing year. The Depression had hit and no one had extra money for luxuries like toy trains. In 1935, working with Walt Disney, Lionel introduced a hand car with Mickey Mouse at, at one end and Minnie Mouse at the controls at the other. These sold for a dollar a piece. Uh, they were also popular and Cowan thought the idea that a mouse had saved the lion was a brilliant one and so even though it wasn't true, he promoted it actively in the newspapers. Until 1937, all locomotives and cars had been tin and painted for detail. But in 1937, a breakthrough, the Hudson. 
For the first time, Lionel was able to economically mass-produce a completely die-cast locomotive with scale model accuracy. This brand new, state-of-the-art set sold for $75, which would equal about $1,200 in today's prices. In 1937, the Lionel Train Corporation went public, issuing 77,500 shares and raising almost a million dollars. In the late 30s, Lionel began to move away from the color and the whimsy that had distinguished its earlier trains and come up with more realistic and detailed models. Standard gauge was abandoned, and there was no question about the direction that Lionel was moving with very realistic models of top-of-the-line locomotives and rolling stock seen around the country. No question about the direction that they were moving um, by the time World War II erupted in the United States in 1941 and the following spring in 1942 when federal restrictions prohibited the, the production of electric trains. In June 1942, production was stopped by World War II. Lionel helped the Navy with navigational products. When the war ended, Lionel trains had a decade of unprecedented success. Baby boomer children all wanted a toy train for Christmas, and Lionel's creative wheels were really turning. Lionel's engineering department was coming up with more and more innovations, from the whistle and the remote control for accessories and operating cars that they developed in the late 1930s. And after the war, you've got smoke, you've got radio um, wave transmitters on trains, and you've got realistic knuckle couplers. So every year the trains are looking better, the line is growing larger. It's a very exciting time for Lionel. After the war, the company continued churning out trains and accessories that were must-haves for kids and adults. After the war, realism is still paramount at Lionel, but it's tempered by a sense of fancifulness, a sense of whimsy. The great example of this is the operating milk car, which children flock to by the thousands and they want that. Also, there are bright and new colorful paint schemes on the new diesels, the F3 diesel that they introduced. So this is a, another great moment in the country, in the Lionel's history. Uh, what makes this happen will be innovations in uh, paint masking, in injection molding of plastics, in powder metallurgy, so Lionel is taking advantage of the latest innovations in technology and developing them and adapting them to their electric trains. 1953 was a peak year in sales, but in 1958, Lionel had its first losing year since the Depression. Interest faded and Lionel turned to airplanes, race cars, fishing rods and reels, trying to diversify. In 1957, Lionel created the Lady Lionel train in, quote, fashion colors of pink and lilac. Although highly collectible now, it was a huge flop. In 1959, with the business in decline, Joshua Cohen sold his company to his great nephew, Roy Cohn. For the next four decades, the Lionel name bounced from owner to owner and managed to survive. Through the years, new models and fresh interest have turned the company around. As we head into a new century, Lionel trains are going strong. Joshua Cohen died at the age of 88 in Palm Beach, Florida. He would no doubt be thrilled to see his trains are still beloved around the world. He was an American success story, an innovator who created a display item and turned it into one of the most recognizable toys of the 20th century. But the man and the company did more. They created something that made a boy feel like a man and a man feel like a boy again. The Lionel Corporation is still in business and still turning out trains for all ages. Let's head over to Baltimore, Maryland now for a visit to the clubhouse of the Baltimore Society of Model Engineers. Not only are the clubhouse and the layouts impressive, so is the club itself, one of the oldest in America. The Baltimore Society of Model Engineers is the second oldest club of model railroad enthusiasts in the nation. Since 1932, people who love model railroading have gathered here in Baltimore to share their love of model railroading and to do their part to preserve the history of railroading. Everywhere you look here, you find museum pieces and impressive artifacts collected by club members during the past 70 years. One of the members of the club had ties to the uh, Baltimore and Ohio Public Relations Department. I don't know whether he worked there, uh, but in any case, he had some ties. And he contacted his counterpart in the PR departments at a number of the other railroads and asked 
them to send to him a, an example of their railroad herald that they would put on their freight cars or box cars, for example, on a four by four sheet of material, plywood or whatever. And uh, what we ended up with is a collection of 32 authentic railroad heralds uh, mounted on a four by four uh, board. So as you go around and look at the different heralds, you'll see that there's different shades of kind of a, a reddish brown color. And we all think of that as boxcar red. And if you buy a, a, a bottle of modeling paint, you just buy boxcar red. Well, each railroad has it, had its idea about what boxcar red was. And here you can get an idea of, of what, they, uh, what they actually thought it was. I don't think you're going to find a collection like this anywhere else in the country. We have uh, the number plate and the builder's plate and a whistle off of a Pennsylvania K4, along with photographs of that locomotive when, when it was in service. The historical artifacts aren't the only things that give this place flavor. Take a look at the reason the club organized in the first place, O-Gage. There's a giant O-Gage layout that wows visitors the minute they walk in the door. 13 feet wide by 70 feet long, the Allegheny Northern rolls through the gentle foothills of the mid-Atlantic Piedmont region. It's a layout that's frozen in time during the 1950s when steam was giving way to diesel. Extraordinary locomotives and rolling stock. Realistic scenery and structures. The main line runs from Baltimore to Johnstown with a few stops in between. It pays homage to a different era, the 1950s, which also happens to be the time Kerry Davis joined the club. I've always been fascinated by trains. My earliest memory was standing on a bridge watching the b and Railroad switch cars around in the 30s. And uh, I was always a Lionel toy train buff. When I found out about uh, the Model Railroad Club here, the BSME, through the Lionel Model Builders magazine back in the 30s, I got on a streetcar, went over to the 1613 North Chester Street, where the club was located, and here was this world of O-scale trains, which I had never seen before. I didn't think anything was available but Lionel except special built uh, scale models. And when I found out it was a hobby that anyone could get into, uh, I, I just, well, I've been here <laughs> ever since. Many uh, visitors are fascinated by the operation of the turntable, how the engines go on the turntable or turned around and backed into the engine house, switching the engines around from one track to another. Uh, there's always a congregation of people right here uh, during our open house uh, shows. I also like to point out the uh, this uh, freight house behind me, built by a man who cannot see. He can't see a thing, and yet he builds structures that are just magnificent. Not only are the cars and scenery realistic, take a look at the track itself. It's Code 172 steel rail hand laid track work. The track work itself is antique and looks much like real steel rail. There's a trolley and an interurban that rolls between the two major cities as well providing passenger service that the primarily coal-hauling main line is not always able to provide. As if all this wasn't enough to keep club members busy, they also have a wonderful and equally large HO layout that was originally added to attract more members. Because HO was a smaller and less expensive end of the hobby back in the 1940s when this was added, it was hoped that adding such a layout would broaden the appeal of the club. It worked. And now the HO layout has taken on a life of its own. The coal mine in the middle of the railroad, I think, is very special. Uh, the locomotive facilities, they, they are dual service facilities for both diesel and uh, steam engine. The Baltimore Society of Model Engineers, hundreds and hundreds of members over the past seven decades who have contributed thousands of hours and an immeasurable amount of love and dedication so that generation after generation of model railroading fans here have a place to call home. Club members say that one of the nice things about having two separate layouts comprised of two separate gauges is that it creates a little friendly competition to see who can operate a more impressive setup. Just 15 miles from the scenic resort town of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, is a wonderful theme park with a classic antique train. It's called Silverwood and it's a great getaway for the entire family. But first, you know that Florida is one of the hot spots to visit in America, but you might not know it's also home to a gem of a model railroad. 
in between the water skiing and the flowers, step inside and take a trip along the eastern seaboard in HO gauge. Welcome to summer and fall and spring and winter. Winter Haven, that is. Welcome to the Cypress Junction Railroad in Winter Haven, Florida. Since 1983, this vast layout has been delighting visitors to Cypress Gardens, a place usually associated with water sports. And gators. And of course, the gardens themselves. You'd have to go to over 80 countries to see everything you can see in one area, uh, thousands of different plants. There's even an elaborate railroad running through one of the gardens. We have done all natural materials as much as possible. The buildings have been built out of leaves and sticks and twigs and acorns. The bridges are all built out of twigs and, and, and kept it as natural and different as possible. We run uh, one European steam train down here and then we also run some more modern trains, just keep things changed around. But it's inside where you'll find one of the world's most popular railroad exhibits. It's a quite elaborate display. Um, there are great miniatures. There's a, a lot of elaborate little um, scenes in there. And it's really interesting because uh, there's very obscure scenes and makes people think, where do I know that from? You know, it's, it's great. You can go from Florida to Maine on this eight show layout, and you can enjoy all four seasons. It gives you a feel for um, each section of the United States, um, what kind of a season goes on there, maybe what per pertains to that, like there's a little Oktoberfest going on, people enjoying lakes, um, Grand Canyon, that kind of a thing. With all this track, more than 1,000 feet, you might expect to find a whole room full of people running the rails, but you won't. Or maybe you're expecting racks of computers making sure these trains run on time. Nope. Actually, they're all on separate circuits. And um, somebody comes in in the morning, an attendant who works here at the gardens comes in and flips two breakers in the room. And one of them is for lights and the other one is for trains. And they just come on and run all day. But that doesn't mean there aren't people involved. It's thanks to the Cypress Gardens Model Railroad Society, a group of dedicated volunteers who keep everything going smooth and strong. When this display originally came to Cypress Gardens, there was a call out for volunteers who had the love of, of the um, HO railroads. And they came in and they made sure everything was proper to scale. And they do come in and um, man that for us from time to time. It doesn't take a lot of upkeep or maintenance, but they come in and they really enjoy it. So they really enjoy coming out here for that. For more than 15 years, they've made sure it looks great every day for the thousands of people who come to admire it. Well, this is the workroom, and this is one of the things that all of us volunteers really like because the gardens has been very gracious to provide us with this big a room. And we have uh, a lot of tools, a lot of machines that we can use, that, uh, a mill and a lathe and stuff like that that we can use. But this is where we do the building of scenes. We try to build them back here and then install them out there so as not to take away from the layout on a longer period of, of time. These are some rock molds. The whole front of the layout is rock molds that we've made, and they're made out of latex rubber. And um, what we do is, is take a, an original rock or petrified wood or coal, makes a good base, and we paint the latex on there in layers, and you put some gauze, about the second or third layer of latex that you put on there, you put some gauze in there impregnated with the latex and then paint three or four more coats maybe a couple more coats of gauze and you have a good mold and then you pour the plaster in there and you you keep it for enough time to where it starts to cure a little bit and then you just put it on where you want it to be it's this kind of attention to detail that makes this attraction a crowd pleaser you realize as you stroll alongside the cypress junction that you're taking a trip not just staring at a bunch of toy trains and fake trees that happens to be my particular thing. I mean, we, all the rest of us feel the same way, but I'm a detail freak. You know, if we're going to have a scene, it needs to look real. You don't want somebody to come in and say, is that something? You want them to come in and say, that's something, uh, a particular scene. And, and that's what we're after with the people and, and making it look real. We try not to put 
a, a semi, for instance, in a place where the Jolly Green Giant would have had to pick it up and sit it down there, we try to make it so it could have backed in there because that's the way it should be if it's going to be looking realistic. There's no way you can gaze over this meandering layout without realizing the love and passion this club has for this railroad. It's just one of the reasons that no matter which season you choose, it's always warm and exciting in Cypress Junction. Just 50 miles from Spokane, Washington, the Silverwood theme park is as unique as it is fun. It attracts nearly 350,000 visitors every season, and it's getting more popular and bigger every year. They come to ride some of the fastest roller coasters in the country, including one that goes underground and actually reaches speeds of up to 60 miles an hour. They come for the wet and wild splash of the water rides. They come for the beautiful scenery. And they come to ride a full-size, classic narrow-gauge train called the Silverwood Central. Gary Norton, a local inventor and entrepreneur, founded Silverwood in the late 1980s with money he had made in the computer business. It began as a unique showcase for vintage trains, planes, and automobiles, built nearly single-handedly by a man who both loves and respects the history of transportation. Well, I like theme parks. I always enjoyed theme parks and being around them and having fun with the, and. I spent a lot of time in Disney and other parks, uh, not just enjoying the park, but sitting there watching and seeing what made it tick, you know, and watching the operation side of it. And I didn't think I was going to build a park at that time, but uh, then this started. Uh, just, the idea just kind of grew. Oh, I like the mechanical end of it. I enjoy the simple mechanics of the old, uh, old engines and some of the old aircraft. It was interesting to, to fly all the old airplanes that I did and it was a great deal of interest working on the train. I, would, I enjoyed getting in the middle of this in the machine shop and making parts for it. And, and it was a lot of fun laying the rail. I mean, that was an interesting story in itself. We didn't know much about laying rail and we started putting it down with uh, spike cameras like we, we saw the uh, movies of old Chinese doing it originally. And we found out that's not the way to do it. We killed everybody we had in the first four or five hours of the first day. And we figured, well, we're three miles to go and we only went maybe 60 feet and everybody was dead, there must be a better way to do it. So uh, then we found out about jackhammers and other ways to put down a rail and eventually we got it all down. The Silverwood Central Railroad fits perfectly into the Victorian mining town motif of this beautiful park, a place that brings to mind a simpler and less hurried age. The train is pulled by old number seven, a Porter 262, which was originally built for the Eureka and Palisades Railroad in Nevada. Norton bought it at auction. It was an auction, it was, it was being sold. Uh, it was Disney, Disney was bidding on it. They wanted it for their theme parks and a number of other people on it. But I said, I'm leaving with that train. And, and that's what we did. The train, a lot of old antique cars and some track and uh, didn't know what I was gonna do with it. Just shipped it up here and then just started planning from there. If number seven is resting, the train is pulled by locomotive number 12, a 1928 Baldwin 262, which was originally built to haul sugarcane for a railroad in Hawaii. No matter which one is doing the work, you can just sit back and enjoy. If you love trains, and you love history, and your kids love to have fun, you have a golden opportunity to find all three at Silverwood Theme Park in northern Idaho. If you're planning a nice long summer trip to the Northwest, we might also point out that the Canadian border is just 90 miles north of Silverwood. Thanks for being with us and please join us next time for more Tracks Ahead.